Thank you all again for joining us for the October 2020 Poetry Festival sponsored by Germana Community College and the Poetry Society of Virginia Northwest Region. Our first session will be a workshop, Teaching Your Words to Dance by Elizabeth Spencer Spragans. Elizabeth is a poet who taught in community colleges in North Carolina and as someone who's done that myself, thank you so much for that, Beth. Before returning here to Virginia, she uses traditional forms, in particular those from Japan and Celtic styles, but with modern, up-to-date, often personal subject matter. She's the author of With No Bridle for the Breeze, Ungrounded Verse, and the Language of Bones, American Journeys Through Bardic Verse. Encourage you to uh, buy her books and uh, when times are safer, I'm sure she will share them with you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, David, and welcome to all of you who are joining us here today for the Teaching Your Words to Dance workshop. I'm inviting you to join me in exploring some poetic footwork that you may be able to adapt or incorporate in your personal writing practice. I encourage you to have at least four or five sheets of paper available and a pen or pencil at hand. So now I'm going to share my screen. And there we go. I'd like to set the context for this workshop by looking briefly at the dance styles that are available to modern poets. Uh, free verse, which evolved after about 1900, does dominate most publications at the moment, but the formal tradition does have a special beauty that many poets find irresistible. We'll explore two very formal styles, the tanka, which is a non-rhyming form, and bardic verse, which is a, a, a rhyming form with strict syllables. So how does one dance the tanka? Well, I have given you a summary of some of the primary characteristics of the tanka. It's a very old form, and it looks a great deal like the haiku, with which many of you may be familiar. The haiku was derived from the tanka in approximately 17th century Japan. Uh, the tanka is much older. It dates back to 7th century Japan. And unlike the haiku, the tanka has five lines compared to the haiku's three. The haiku juxtaposes two images as a phrase, which typically spans two lines, and then a third line, which consists of a fragment. And the haiku refers to a specific season. And in the purest form, the haiku does not involve the poet emotionally the poet maintains an emotional distance from the poem. That's very different from the tanka, which has looser rules with that respect. And the tanka pivots. It basically consists of an upper poem and a lower poem. And we'll see how that plays out in just a moment. Visually, they uh, appear to be very similar. There's no title, there's no capitalization and minimal punctuation, primarily a dash, occasionally an ellipsis, and emotions are conveyed in the tanka, much more so than in the purest form of the haiku. You will notice uh, in this example that the third line of the upper poem is identical to the first line of the lower poem. 
And when you combine them, you have a tonka. And one of the things you'll probably notice right off is that I titled my tonka. So I am deliberately breaking the rules, which one can do if, uh, as long as one knows what the rules are and it's a conscious choice. This is a poem from my collection with no bridle for the breeze entitled Morning Sparks. When the sun kindles waters soft and still with sleep, a goldfinch blazes through the crack where dark meets dawn on wings that beat like bellows. And there's the cover of my collection with no bridle for the breeze. I have a number of different styles of tanka included in this work, which is a celebration of, of flight on wings, feathers, and dreams. Some of the styles that I've included are reflective of the 10 classical types of tanka. And I'll share three poems from the collection to give you a sense of some of the diversity that appears. Kindling, cardinals nesting on the chapel window ledge, a shard of stained glass hidden in the brittle grass catches fire at break of day. And you'll notice in this poem, there is a human made structure present, which is not typical of haiku. Clarity. Cotton clouds adrift on this liquid looking glass. Beneath the mountain, a stately great blue heron slowly walks across the sky. This one as an inversion of perspective. And yet another example, racing the day. When my vessel leaps and canters through the currents, wind song fills my sails, but in notes of buoy bells, I taste the salt of twilight. And in that poem, you see the poet actually does enter into the scene. So let's get ready to tango with Tonka. I invite you to take two minutes or so and think of an image from your favorite fall or winter holiday and describe this image in concrete terms using all five senses and your goal is to fill the page. You're not writing poetic lines at this point. You're simply writing descriptive phrases that, that evoke the memory uh, as clearly as you can. So you can consider this a warm up with the upper body. So we'll take about two minutes for that. And I will give you a 30 second warning when we hit uh, the, the end of the time.
Okay, take about 30 more seconds and conclude the thought with which you're working. Okay, if you would, you'll go ahead and wrap that up. You are now ready to do some preliminary tango steps. So I uh, invite you to use those descriptive phrases as starting points for some poetic lines. And your focus here is probably at this point just to aim for, for short lines about the length of a breath, no longer, but uh, you don't necessarily need to worry about syllable counts at this point. In fact, most Japanese poets uh, write much shorter lines than the traditional uh, five, seven, five count for haiku or the longer for tanka. So just, if you would, try to generate the equivalent of a breath or shorter and just some phrases. And take about 30 more seconds and finish up whatever phrase or phrases you're working on. Okay, now comes the fun part. You get to pivot your tanka. So change partners. Now we're going to focus on the lower body of the poem. So for this piece, if you would, I invite you to reflect on how you feel or how you felt at this particular event or image. And just write two or three lines, again, not exceeding one breath per line. So now, for this point, just focus on the lower piece of your pole. And we'll take about two minutes for that.
you have about 30 more seconds. Do this. Okay, now it's time to tango with abandon. <laughs> For this part of the work, you want to pull the lower poem and the upper poem, the lower and the upper together, so that you get five lines. And the biggest trick to be successful with this is to consider possibly rearranging the sequence because getting the right pivot, the one in the middle, is, is the really key piece to having a successful poem. So looking at the lines that you've written, play around, if you would, with maybe rearranging them. But uh, th there's no right or wrong answer. <clears throat> it, it's what works for your poem and your feelings. So take about three minutes to, to play with this. And if you don't finish, that's fine. Uh, it will probably come to you in the middle of the night. You can have a pad next to your bed tonight, and the solution will just mag magically appear while you're asleep. But let's take about three minutes if you want to to, to play with this. Can't do this. Okay, take about a half a minute and wrap that up. <clears throat> If you have even two lines that you're really thrilled with, Congratulate yourself because this is a very difficult exercise. Very, very challenging. So you probably are going to want to work on that more later, but I hope this gave you a flavor for what's involved in creating a tanka and you can return to it at your leisure. So now we're going to shift. We have a new band, a new mood, and bardic verse in the Celtic style is up. So we're going to try it. 
something completely different now. And I hope that uh, we'll have a chance to do some basic steps with this uh, and uh, get your feet wet, so to speak. So speaking of Celtic verse, who are the Celts? Well, they were very fleet of foot. They went all over Europe all over the area north of the Mediterranean, and they brought a distinctive language to the region, and their arts were breathtakingly innovative. Their contributions to literature and art uh, are quite notable, and you probably are familiar with the basic oh. Celtic knot. And if you think about that in terms of the typical art in a museum, I think you may get a sense of just how innovative the Celtic arts were compared to what was traditional in the rest of Europe. The Celtic languages, which influenced uh, literature in Europe, uh, are divided into two main families, the Britonic and the Gaelic. And we are going to focus primarily on the Welsh forms, of course, in English, but that's what we'll look at this afternoon. The Welsh adored their poets, and they still adore their poets. They have a tradition, which of course is no longer in force, of uh, having a resident bard or poet in every noble house. And these bards competed in what you might consider the literary Olympics of the day. Uh, up until the 16th century, uh, they vied for chief poet awards. And the way this worked was official poetic parameters were set to make the competitions easier to judge. And as of the 14th century, there were 24 official poetic meters that were used in these competitions. So we're going to look at some of these meters. I hope you're ready to take a journey into some scary verse. And incidentally, although there are some scary poems in my book, The Language of Bones, they are not all scary. Uh, this is basically a uh, a journey from Jamestown to California that describes what the land, landscape would say if the landscape could speak, and the land, landscape is speaking in the traditional poetic forms of the bards, uh, the Celts. So I'd like to share uh, the opening point from this collection with you. It's entitled Jane. And it's set in Jamestown. And the basis of the poem is the discovery in 2012 of the skeleton of a young girl oh. that uh, was in a Jamestown cellar. She was unearthed and there were no records of who she was. So the researchers named her Jane and her skeleton provided the first physical evidence that the colonists of Jamestown cannibalized those who died during the horrible winter of 1609 to 1610 that they called the starving time. A couple of other notes about this poem. The Virginia Company of London recruited labor for Jamestown by providing ship passage to immigrants who signed indentured servitude contracts. Uh, you'll see the appearance of a moccasin in this poem. I hope you've never run into one. They are venomous snakes that are very common uh, in Virginia in the aquatic region. And a lynn, L-I-N-N, -N, is a pool beneath a waterfall. So here is an example of one of the Welsh poetic forms Jane. The hunger pads on restless paws and probes the palisade for flaws. Jaws devour the gate barred thrice. Then hunger hews my flesh from bone and gnaws my name from graveless stone. 
hones the blade of sacrifice that hovers over every head. We dine on horror, drink our dread, bury dead in snow and ice. My eyes are lifeless, yet I laid the table as my mistress bade. Debts are paid, a meal my price, but guests I fed will never dare to meet my disembodied stare. Fasting prayer can nourish vice. The dark without, the dark within, the deadly fangs of moccasin taint the lens of paradise. So what happened in that poem as far as the structural elements? As you can see here, I've highlighted the rhyme scheme that was at work. And as you see, the, the third line carries an end rhyme throughout the poem. And the first and second have a cross rhyme with the first five lines of the third. And the syllable counts are required to be 887 for each stanza. So here's another one in that same form. <clears throat> this one is based on a Paiute tradition uh, that is prevalent in the Utah area. This poem is set in Bryce Canyon. If any of you have been there, the rock formations in the canyon are incredibly lifelike, and they do resemble humans who've been turned to stone in some instances. In the legends of the Native American people in that region, a coyote, who is referred to as a trickster in many Native American uh, stories, has a role of overseeing the land, and he uh, decides to punish the greedy legend people who inhabited the area. He lured them all to a feast, and then he cursed them, turning them to stone. So curse of the canyon. The old ones listen for the sound of life within this painted ground. Spellbound creatures in tableau were once a race seduced by greed. They hoarded every nut and seed with no thought to feed the crow or leave a single prickly pear for sister deer or brother bear. With no care for earth below their feet, the legend people preened and strutted while the hungry keened and gleamed in vain where rocks grow. Coyote, in the guise of friend, prepared a feast, bid foes attend, penned them there and struck his blow. The trickster turned them into stone that desert winds harass and hone. Day fire sets their bones aglow. Their eyes are blind, their tongues are mute. But when the night wind plays her flute, Paiute hear a moan pitched low. And this one is an incomplete, completely different form of frequent. Uh, and this is by request for those who have been owned by a cat to roar. In feline dreams, a hot sun gleams and forest teems with fur and fowl. As green eyes gaze at logs that blaze, this tiger slays the great horned owl that calls each night from hemlock's height and then takes flight in feathered cowl and tufted hat. A touch, a pat, once more mere cat with timid growl. The embers die and daydreams fly on clouds too high to stalk or prowl. And for the repent, you can see the rhyme scheme again, that last line, 
uh, of the stanza is carrying uh, rhyme throughout the poem, and then each stanza has a separate secondary rhyme of work. And this is the one I'm going to invite you to play with. Uh, how does a poet know the footwork for such a dance? Well, this is the scheme that you see, and the X's are indicative of the non-rhyming syllables. So if you were to look at a reference text, this would be the type of instruction that you would see to tell you how to write bardic verse. So are you ready to box step? First thing we need to do is choose a dance club. So I invite you to reflect on a trip you took this year. If you have been very conservative in your travel, as I have been, it may be only to the grocery store. If you uh, have only gone to the mailbox, that's a right too. But pick some destination that is memorable for you. And if this doesn't resonate with you, you are welcome to think of a trip that you took maybe last year. But think of something that has a lot of uh, descriptive elements that you can use in your poem. So reflect on that and take another piece of paper and survey your closet. Write down phrases with key details and it will be helpful if you use all five senses if you possibly can. And as you're doing this within the phrase, and it doesn't have to be the last word of the phrase, uh, try to find words that look like they might be potential rhyming uh, keys, maybe. Uh, something that strikes you as a possibility and circle those words. So if you would, we'll take about uh, five minutes to do this. And uh, I'll give you a 30 second warning.
if you take about 30 more seconds and finish that, that phase of the piece, that'd be great. Okay, now you're ready to practice your box step, break in those shoes. If you would, take your circled words, the words that look like they were possibilities for rhymes, and write them across the top of a second sheet of paper. And then you can list possible rhyming words underneath each one. Uh, if you have a facility with that, you might be able to come up with them right off the top of your head, or you can go to rhymezone.com uh, and that will help you generate some more words. But again, we're just practicing now, so uh, no stress if you have a, a few that don't seem to work or want to cooperate with you. If you find that none of your circle words seem to have any good rhymes, you might want to choose some others. Let's take about uh, three or four minutes to uh, play with this. Okay, take about 30 seconds and wrap up that phase. And now we're ready to circle the ballroom floor. So take uh, your phrases there and see if, or your words, and see if you can write two, three, or four lines that rhyme. 
And uh, again, you don't worry about the syllable counts. We're just practicing. You can make your box step rectangular, square, whatever shape you want. Uh, just uh, aim for lines that are somewhat comparable in length. And uh, your last line, if you continue with this, will set up the rhyme that carries throughout the poem. So take about four minutes and see if you can come up with two, three, or four lines, whichever works for you. Okay, if you have uh, a stanza, you can go ahead and circle the ballroom floor again and begin a new stanza altogether. And again, you would want to carry the end rhyme forward for your last line of your second stanza. If you aren't to that point yet, feel free to continue playing with the one you started with, your first stanza, uh, whatever works for you.
can take about 30 seconds and find a stopping point with whatever you're working on. Okay, uh, I'd like to share some uh, resources with you. I hope that this has been inspiring for you and you would like to pursue it. Uh, if you do, uh, the books up here are quite helpful. Turco's Book of Forms is quite international in scope and describes the structure of formal poetry in from many different eras and from many different countries. So I think that would be very helpful to you. If you are serious about pursuing rhyming poetry, there's a, a real value to having a, a hard copy reference. I shared uh, the online tool RhymeZone with you, but uh, it is not nearly as comprehensive as a, a traditional rhyming dictionary. So that might be something you would like to make use of. And then uh, if you're curious about other examples, my two books uh, have examples of the American style tanka and other bardic verse. I'd like to conclude with a challenge for you. Vincent Van Gogh once said, if you hear a voice within you say, you cannot paint, then by all means paint, and the voice will be silent. So please paint, write, sing, dance, dream, and follow your heart with abandon. Thank you so very much for joining me today. And I don't think we have time for questions unless there's one really really tiny one that can be yeah so we can go ahead and do questions uh okay. there is one on chat that asked what is ungrounded verse ah that was a reference uh, and i'll stop uh, the screen share uh that was a reference to the theme of that book the uh, with No Bridle for the Breeze is a collection of pieces that deal with flight, with uh, feathers, meaning birds, uh, paired wings, dragonflies and the like, and dreams. So excellent question. Thank you very much. Any others? Okay, I don't see any other questions. Unless... Okay, well, thank you so much. Oh, wait, there's one more. Uh, what The question is, what advice would you give to poets who are not yet published? Oh, excellent question. I would, I would above all encourage you to find or form a group, a supportive group. Uh, there's so many that, uh, advantages to working with other poets or other writers. Uh, there's the, the support that uh, only another writer can understand of what some of these things mean to you. Uh, family and friends can only go so far as far as that goes. Uh, they are the people who can help you stay uh, on track. They can offer honest feedback uh, in a, a gentle way. 
for problems that you can't see yourself when you're writing. And they can also share tips and submission opportunities with you. Uh, it, the value of having a group of fellow writers uh, is just incalculable. So a group like Poetry Society of Virginia is, is phenomenal. Uh, Virginia also has the Virginia Writers Club. And wherever you are, whatever state or uh, place, um, there's bound to be a group for you. And I encourage you to take advantage of it. So again, thank you for that question. Any others? Okay, David. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I so appreciate your time. And I do hope that uh, you have found some tools that you can use in your own work, even if you're a free verse poet. Uh, these uh, tools can enhance, I hope, what you write. So thank you again and enjoy the rest of the program. And thank you, Beth. And um, everybody, uh, if you want to do that uncomfortable thing they're doing on TV where you pretend to applaud, that would be fine. But um, we deeply appreciate the workshop. Um, as you said, whether free verse or formal, uh, one of the big differences of poetry and normal speak is the music. So thank you so much. <laughs>